Morning, everyone. Hey, uh, so I'm here at Calvary Baptist Church, and there's nobody in this building with me. But that's okay. I thank you all for your understanding and your support in the decision that we had to make to not hold services together as this pandemic continues to ravage our nation. I'm most concerned about our elderly population and so many of us working in healthcare environments and things, it's just not worth risking anybody's life. I do love you all, I miss you all. And thinking of us not being together, here it is the second Sunday already of December, and not being together and everything else, well it's a messed up Christmas, isn't it? And I started to think about that first Christmas because it always looks so idyllic, the nativity scenes, and we see the how pretty everything is, and uh, we, we think of, of Jesus in that manger and, and everybody standing around. We don't think about how cold it may have been in that stable, how badly it must have smelled, how uncomfortable it must have been for Mary and Joseph, the things that were going on. But there was another thing going on as well. There was an incredible threat hanging over their heads. Uh, if Herod would have got word of that, if he would have known. He was, an, he was an animal. He was a monster. And if he would have got word that there was a threat to his reign as king, as king of the Jews, what would he have done? Many of you know where I'm going with this. He did get word of that, didn't he? A little bit later, and that is when the wise men came to see him. So we're going to look in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. And we're going to read about another less than perfect Christmas so it starts out in Matthew in verse 13. It says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And it and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all of the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. This is what we know as the slaughter of the innocents, when Herod ordered the the children to be put to death. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel reaping, weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose, and he took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream. And he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came, and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So you notice all of these prophecies and how they all came together, how Herod was trying so, so desperately. But all Herod was doing was fulfilling prophecy. He thought he was so powerful. He thought he had so much going on, but Herod was actually just being used by God as well. Even his evil deeds were used by God for good. You see, all these prophecies being fulfilled, well, they point us toward the clarification that, indeed, Jesus was the Son of God. As all these prophecies are fulfilled, now we suddenly know, look, let's check them off. Boom, 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 boom. He's the Christ. He can be no other. There was a great theologian who started out hating Christianity. His name is C.S. Lewis. And those of you who know me, you understand that he is one of my, one of my all-time literary heroes. I think he's just a master writer and philosopher, theologian, whatnot, but he, he poised this theory and he, and he called it Lord, liar, lunatic. And he said, Jesus claimed to be Lord. We know 
through various, several other historical sources separate from the Bible that Jesus lived, that Jesus existed. And as he lived, he claimed to be Lord. So we've determined he existed, and we know that he was Lord, or that he said he was Lord. So if he's claiming to be God, he either was God, or he was lying, or he was crazy. And you look at all the people and all the all of the different ministries that he began, and you consider all the prophecies that he fulfilled. And as he fulfilled all of these prophecies, well, that was pointing toward him saying, well, indeed, he had to be God. He led those guys around for three years. Why would he be lying all that time and none of them figure it out? What did he have to gain by lying? I mean, he, he died on a cross a horrible way after being beaten. And then he was crucified. And all he had to do was say to Pontius Pilate, no, I'm not, I'm not king of the Jews. This was all a big misunderstanding. I'll, I'll go home to Nazareth and behave myself. If he was a liar, that's what he would have done. He wouldn't have stuck with that lie in order to be killed. None of them got rich. In fact, every single disciple, even after Christ's ascension, hung in there. And they fulfilled all that prophecy. They preached, they planted churches, and all with the exception of John, died horrible deaths. People don't do that for a lie. Was he a lunatic? Could he continue that hallucination for three years? People saw the miracles. They saw what he had done. They heard his teaching, and it was put in such a deliberate way. It was taught so beautifully and so clear, so articulate, that lunatics don't talk like that. And again, what did he have to gain? At no point did, did he have these episodes that we associate with first century unmedicated lunacy. Lord, liar, lunatic. You eliminate the last two, Jesus is Lord. And all of these prophecies that have been fulfilled point us towards seeing that. You see, he was Lord and is Lord even when Christmas doesn't make sense, even when it's not perfect. And this is definitely a less than perfect Christmas. I know I, I go into work and, you know, we're playing Christmas music. And I'm sorry, my boss, if you're listening to this, I, I hate turning it on in the mornings. Sometimes I forget to. But <laughs> I can't, uh, I don't know, it's, it just feels weird with all the things going on. And, and I hear the, the happy Christmas songs, and I'm trying. I'm trying to let, that, let those songs, I try to sing along with them. I try so hard to get, get it in my head that it's going to come and we need to celebrate this. We're going today to get a tree. I'm going to put that up, and I hope that helps. <laughs> but it's a long way from perfect. But it's still Christmas. He's still God, and he's still on the throne. I wanted to share something with you guys. Some of you know Irma Bombeck. Well, this is a fictional correspondence between Irma Bombeck and Martha Stewart. And the first letter is from Martha Stewart. And she says, Hi, Irma. This perfectly delightful note is being sent on paper that I made myself to tell you what I've been up to. Since it snowed last night, I got up early and I made a sled with old barn wood and a glue gun. I hand painted it in gold leaf, got out my loom and made a blanket in peaches and mops. Now it's time to start making the placemats and napkins for my 20 breakfast guests. I'm serving the old standard Stuart 12-course breakfast, but I didn't have time to make the tables and chairs this morning, so I used the ones I already had. I did take time to make the dishes to use for breakfast from Hungarian clay, which you can get at almost any Hungarian craft store. While I must run, I need to finish the buttonholes on the dress I'm wearing for breakfast. I'll get out the sled and drive this note to the post office as soon as the glue dries on the envelope I'll be making. Love, Martha Stewart. Does that sound like any of you this morning or Christmas morning? Probably not. But Irma's, Irma sounds, let's, let's a little closer to home. Listen to what her response was. 
Dear Martha, I'm writing this on the back of an old shopping list. Pay no attention to the coffee and jelly stains. I'm 20 minutes late getting my daughter up for school. Packing a lunch with one hand on the phone with a dog uh, with a dog pound. Seems old rough needs bailing out again. Burnt my arm on a curling iron when I was trying to make those cute curly fries. Still can't find the scissors to cut out some snowflakes. Tried using an old disposable razor, trashed a tablecloth. Tried that cranberry thing, frozen cranberries mushed up after I defrosted them in the microwave. Oh, and don't use Fruity Pebbles as a substitute in that Rice Krispie Snowball recipe unless you happen to like a disgusting shade of green. The smoke alarm is going off. Talk to you later. Love, Irma. Sounds a whole lot to me like Christmas 2020, doesn't it? Yeah, it's messed up. We can't meet in church. I opened up my Facebook. It was a week or so ago. And some of the memories came back. And those memories that popped up, well, they were scary because what I was seeing was the incredible Christmas that we had here at Calvary last year. Do you remember? We had a special event every single Sunday. We had the magician come in. We had a guitar player and singer come in. We had a big Christmas party. We had our Christmas play with the children. We... It was festive. We partied the entire month of December 2019. 2020 is a whole different, whole different ball game. Remember how packed we were on Christmas Eve? Remember how packed we were for the play? Look at this. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's depressing, it's sad, but it's what it is, guys. And I don't want to spend this sermon lamenting and complaining and saying, oh, I wish this, I wish that, I wish it were different. You, we all do. So put that aside. Christmas is celebrating when Jesus came. When the God, when, when the Master, when the Creator of the universe, when He stepped down off of His throne... In a place where there was no pain, no death, no sorrow. There is no crying in heaven, by the way. And he took the form, not of a conquering hero, not as a, a Caesar, not as a... He took the form of a helpless little baby boy. Born to a poor Jewish family that was rejected because of an unwed pregnancy and grew up losing people that he loved, feeling pain, dealing with betrayal, dealing with rejection. And he gave his life for you and me. Because until he did that, until he came out of that tomb, we were living in a hopeless world. Yeah, hopeless. He brought hope to a hopeless world. So this year it's going to be different. I showed you all those empty pews to make a point. Of all the great things we did last year, and of all the fun that we had, the best part of it was the fellowship that we were together. And with this COVID thing going around, you know, we aren't together like we used to be. We can't be. But that's okay. It won't last forever. We'll enjoy next year incredibly well, but guys, we can still enjoy this year because we're not celebrating our families. We're not celebrating our gifts. We're not celebrating all the incredible food. Not that those things aren't great, but we're celebrating the day that God stepped out of heaven, that he came down and said, I love my creation so much that I'm going to leave glory and I'm going to suffer. That I'm going to give my life for these creatures because they're my children and I love them. I'm going to give them an opportunity to be forgiven of their sins, to be restored. And all they have to do is ask me into their hearts. Yeah, we can beat ourselves up this year and we can be sad and we can be depressed. Or 
we can concentrate on what's really important. Think about that first Christmas. So here's Jesus laying in a manger, right? And Mary and Joseph standing around. These crazy shepherds come flying in, screaming and yelling. All of these things are going on. Everybody had been called to their own town to be taxed, as we read in Luke chapter 2. And Bethlehem was crowded. It was packed. Everybody who was from there had to go back there to register for the census. And so as they're all gathered around, there's incredible family reunions and parties and everything going on. And all of these people are talking and laughing and enjoying seeing one another again. And they're crowding into these houses and they're, you know, crowding around tables and, and all of these wonderful things are going on. And they had a good time. At least they thought they did. But what did they miss? Yeah, they were having a good time, but you realize that they missed the opportunity to see the Messiah as a baby, to see the Messiah coming into the world, to see the Savior of humanity being born. They thought that hanging around with their families and, and eating all this good homemade food, they thought drinking the wine, they thought that was the ultimate. But they were so busy in what they were doing that they missed something that is incomparable. So I want to pose that to you this morning. Is that what you might be guilty of? Because I think I've been guilty of it. So worried about not being able to have the big family gatherings, not being able to have the big church gatherings, missing this, missing that, blah, blah, blah. You know, God, guys, we do good pity parties for ourselves, don't we? But hope came into the world on Christmas Day. And it changed. And yeah, maybe we're not having the big parties and we're not having the gatherings, but people are still looking for hope. They're leading hopeless lives and they need Jesus because they don't have him in their lives. Rather than concentrate on what we don't have this year, rather than concentrate on what we can't do, rather than getting so tied up and misty eyed about how great last year was versus how rough this year is. Look around. Jesus is in your heart for a reason. and He told you, you are to be the light of the world. Moaning, crying, lamenting. Guys, that's not a good witness. That's not who Jesus called us to be. That's not showing the light. We have to step out of our own circumstances and obey God when He said, be the light of the world, be the salt of the earth. He stepped out of heaven to come to a cesspool. Can you and I step out of our own little pity party to show love to somebody who needs it this year? I'm thinking we can. I love you guys. I miss you guys. And I promise we'll be together soon. Pray with me, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Dear God, I pray for this congregation. I pray, Lord, for everyone who is out there and watching us on the Internet. I pray, Lord, for everyone who maybe somebody's got to see this, Lord, that is leading a life without hope, that don't care if they even wake up tomorrow morning. God, I pray that you send somebody into their lives that will give them a reason to look forward to being awake the next day. God, I pray that you will use us, your people, let us be your hands and feet in this lost world. And Lord, let us reach out to people in need with your love. Dear God, always remind us that the real Christmas, Lord, it's all about the day that creation was saved from doom. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. Guys, I don't know when I'm going to see you again. It could be next Sunday. It may not be. We don't know. And that's been the most frustrating part of this last eight or nine months is not knowing. But I do know what I know. That I love you. That I miss you. 
and that this won't last forever. Let's keep one another in our prayers. We'll be in touch.